Welcome to the John Gets Games tutorial playthrough for Foundations of Rome. In this video, I'll be showing you how to play the game while we're actually playing it, and if you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough all the way to the end, then you can find a link for that down below in the description or up there in the top corner. Now before we move on, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes while we play through the game, and that lets me put corrections directly on the screen and you should be able to see them. Now what's going on in Foundations of Rome is each player is trying to purchase the best plots of land so that they can put down bigger and better buildings in a communal grid. Now these buildings will increase your income as well as your population and give you a wide variety of ways to score points based off of the buildings that you've placed as well as the buildings that your opponents have put down. Now I'll explain how all of these details work while we're playing, but before we jump in, I would like to ask that if you enjoyed this video, that you please click the like button for it down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Also, if you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool perks like voting on a couple of the videos that I film each month. Alright, let's now jump into the game. Out here, the game is fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now I do want to mention that this is a prototype version of the game, so the art and components are not necessarily what you'll find in the final version. In particular, I'd like to point out that the ownership markers right over here are going to be significantly larger in the final version of the game. Well, let's start things off, and today we will be playing as the red player right over here. So we are going to be the starting player as well, and on a player's turn, they are going to take one action from three different options. After they take that action, then play will move on to the next player in a clockwise pattern, and we will keep going around in a clockwise order until we finish one of the three rounds in the game. Now a round will finish once every card in one of these round stacks is completed, and then there will be an end of round scoring, but I'll explain the details of all of that a little bit later. So let's go ahead and take our turn, and the three options that we have for our turn are taking income, buying a plot of land, or constructing a building out into Rome. Well, out of those three actions, I think let's start by constructing a building into Rome. Now, as you can see at the start of the game, we have six of these ownership markers placed out onto these locations, and so do both of our opponents. Now, that is because as part of setup, we were randomly given six cards from the deck, and we just put our ownership markers down onto them. Now, it is worth noting that there is an optional variant as part of setup, where you can instead draft these cards by having each player select one and then pass the rest to the left, and then draw another one from the cards that were just given to you until you have the six cards, and then you put your ownership markers out. But today, I just went with a random deal. So let's proceed with our construction action, and the way this works is we are going to place a building from our player board down onto lots that we already control. Now, the size of the building is going to be dictated by the number of adjacent lots that we have. As you can see at the start of the game, we have two pairs of adjacent lots, and then a couple single lots over here. So, let's come back to our player board, and as you can see, we have 24 buildings to choose from, and they come in a variety of different shapes. This one is just a single lot size, for instance, and this one is three lots in that specific pattern. Now, as you can see, our buildings come in three different colors, and there are eight of each color. Uh, these over here, for instance, are residential buildings, and those increase our population, which will give us points at the end of the round. Over here, these gray buildings are commercial buildings, which will give us victory points as well as money, and we will need money to buy more plots. And lastly, there are these civic buildings right over here, and they give a variety of conditional victory points at the end of each round. So we know that our options are building a single size plot like these, or a double size plot in a line. And I think let's start off by constructing a pottery studio. This is going to increase our overall income, and getting money is certainly important to buy more plots to be able to put more buildings down. Now, it is worth noting that there is no cost to actually put these buildings out onto the board. We just spend money to buy plots, and I'll explain how that works very soon. So, let's add this to the board, and I think we'll put it right over here. Now, when we do that, we're going to pull back both of these ownership markers, and we can now see that we have increased our money income by one. And we can also tell that by just looking to the gap in our player board where that building was. Now this also shows a two victory point spot, and those are points that we will generate at the end of each round, as long as that pottery studio is still out in Rome. Alright, our turn is done, so play can now go clockwise to the green player, and they have decided to buy a plot of land. Now they have decided they would like to buy the plot E1, and they have to spend money equal to the value that is above that card. So in this case, they have to spend three out of their starting six money, and then they have to take one of their available ownership tokens and put it down onto the applicable spot. 
So that is right over here, and it's worth noting that you are not allowed to buy a plot of land if you don't have any ownership tokens to actually put out onto the board. Now, after that, they can put this face down into their stack of cards, and this is realistically just here to prove that you own a particular plot of land. There is no way that you actually lose these cards as we play through the game. Now, before we move on, I do want to mention that the size of Rome is going to vary depending on the player count. If this was a two-player game, we would just be using these gray numbers in a 7x7 seven seven grid, but this is a three-player game, which means we've added these blue grid spots into the game. If it was a four-player game, we'd add the pink, and if this was a five-player game, we'd use these red spots, which means the entire board would be in play. At this point, the green player can finish out their turn by sliding all of these cards over, and then they draw a new card from the round one deck. So they can put that face up right here, and it's now time to talk about how the round is going to end. Now over here, these decks are in roughly equal stacks, and as soon as the last card comes out onto the row, the end of the round is going to be near. Now once we get to that point, then when everyone buys a lot, we will not refresh more cards because there will be no cards in that round. And once the last card is purchased, then every player will get one more turn, including the player who took that last card, and then the round will be over and we will go into scoring. Now again, I'll talk about the scoring in just a minute, I just wanted you to know how the round structure worked. Alright, it's now the blue player's turn, and they have decided to construct a Domus Maximus. In this case, they have just one option available, so they can pull these ownership markers back. They can then put that right here, and they have just increased their population by two. They can also tell this by looking to the empty slot on their player board, and population is going to be worth points at the end of the round, and the player who has the most population is going to get bonus points, so it looks like they are already starting off on that race. Well, it's once again our turn, and just like always, we can construct, take income, or we can buy a plot. Now, I don't really like any of the plots at the moment, and we have a decent amount of money, so I figure let's just go ahead and build again, and let's just get another one of these Pottery Studios out to further increase our money. Now, this will give us more money when we take income, and I'll explain that very soon. So, let's add this to the only legal spot on the board for it. With that, our turn is done, and now the green player can go, and they've decided to put one of these bakeries out onto the board. Now, that's just going to increase their income by one, and they've decided to put it right over here. It's now the blue player's turn, and they want to buy this plot of land. Now, that's going to cost them three of their starting money, and you may have noticed that at the start of the game, we had five money, the green player had six, and the blue player had seven, just to account for the uh, starting player advantage. So in this case, they can put their ownership marker out onto H1, and that is next to one of their other ownership markers. So blue can finish out their turn by revealing another card, and that is the plot E5. Now that is right over here, and that's interesting because it is adjacent to a building that we have already constructed. Now when you do a construct action, you are allowed to overbuild on top of buildings you've already constructed, and I'll explain the details of that soon, uh, especially considering I think we want to buy this plot. Now, unfortunately, we currently have five money and that costs 10. So I think for this turn, let's take income. Now, the way this works is very simple. You are just going to add up all of the coins on the constructed buildings that you have. And then on top of that, you take five more money. So we have five plus one plus one or seven money. And we can add that to the five that we started with, which means we now have 12. All right, we are done. So the green player gets to go and they have decided they would like to buy the C3 plot. That is going to cost them three coins, which means they currently have no money at all, and then they can put an ownership marker down onto that location. After that, they can slide all of these down, and the next plot is D7. After this, the blue player can go, and they've decided to construct a pottery studio right over here. All right, it's now our turn again, and fortunately, the plot that we wanted got cheaper. So we can spend eight of our money in order to put an ownership marker down onto E5. Then we can slide this over, and the next plot is B3. Well, moving on, the green player is going to put a pottery studio right over here. After this, the blue player can go, and they're going to spend all of their money, which is four, and that lets them buy the plot C1. After that, the next plot is going to be D6. Okay, it's our turn again, and I think we want to do the first overbuild action of the game. Now, as you can see, we own both of these lots because we have a building on it, and there's also this lot right here. So that means that there is this L shape as an option, and we have a couple of these on our board. 
Now, if we placed this one out, that would obviously replace a pottery studio. So we would effectively be adding one to our income and one to our victory points. But instead, if we placed this out, then of course that would hurt our victory points by two and our income by one, but it would put four population out. And population is worth points at the end of the round, plus you get a bonus amount of points if you have the most population. So I think let's leverage the situation to increase our population this turn. So let's now construct this insulae, and whenever you are overbuilding, the new building must be at least one size larger than every other building that is currently being removed. So in this case, this is a size 3 versus a size 2, so we can pull this one off and our ownership marker, and we can put that right over there. Now it's worth noting that you can actually find yourself in situations where you can overbuild on top of multiple buildings. Uh, so in this case, if we had put a three down like this one, we could place that right there. Uh, this is a three and both of these are twos, so that means both of these can be removed. And in this example, obviously we would have owned this location. So when the overbuild action was done, we would have had to put an ownership marker right over here to continue to show that we have that plot. Once again, once you buy a plot of land in this game, there's nothing that is going to take that away from you. So let's come back to our board, and this ownership marker goes into our supply, and the pottery studio heads right over here, where it can then be constructed again later on in the game. All right, that has finished out our turn, and at this point, the only other major thing I need to teach you is what happens at the end of a round. Now, obviously, we are not there yet, but again, the round will end once every single card from the round stack has been bought from this market. And at that point, every player, including the person who took the last lot, will take one more turn, and then we go into end of round scoring. So let's now pretend like the round is over, so that means this row would be empty and this stack would also be gone. And the first thing that we would score is our residential buildings. Now, the way this works is players will get one point for every population they have. So in this example, we would get four points, the green player would get none, and the blue player would get two. And then the player who has the highest population will get a bonus, which depends on the round. In the first round, that bonus is four extra points. In the second round, it's seven. And in the third round, it is ten. And if multiple people tie for the most population, then they both share in that reward. Now, victory points will be marked up here, and players can also track their population down here. So obviously at this point we have four population and the blue player has two. And I do want to mention that there is an advanced population scoring option instead of the one that I just described. Now the way the advanced one works is the player who has the highest population will get points as normal. So that is one point for every population they have, plus they will get a four, seven, or 10 point bonus. And then the second place player in the population track will get points equal to the population of the first player. So in this case, it is a uh, hypothetical end of round one. So that means we would get four points plus four or eight. And then the blue player would get four points because that is our population. Then after that, the next player would get points equal to the second place player. But you only ever get population points if you have at least one population. So in this example, obviously the green player would get nothing. Now today we were going to use the standard population scoring. I just wanted you to know about that advanced option. After players have scored their residential buildings, it's now time to score the civic buildings. Now, each one of these has a different conditional way to give points, and it has to do with the adjacent buildings to the specific scoring civic building. Now, adjacency in this game is just orthogonal, so diagonals do not count. And uh, for example, this one right here gives one point for every population on buildings that are adjacent to this one. And it's worth noting that those population buildings can be from any player. Now, there are a couple other conditional options. This one gives three points for each adjacent civic building that is next to this, and you can tell that these are civics because they have that icon right down there when you remove them. Now, there are also uh, civic buildings that give points for the coins that are adjacent to it, like this market right over here. And lastly, there are uh, civic buildings which give points for any type of building, not necessarily the civic ones. After that, players can move into the final scoring, which is commercial buildings. Now, the way this works is players are just going to get the points that are uh, showing on these spots on the board, and players are also going to get any coins that are showing. Now, this is different than the income action because that gives you five more coins. So as an example, this would give five plus two or seven points plus four money. Now, that's the way it would work for the scoring in round one and two. But in scoring for round three, which is also the end of the game, players are just going to get victory points instead of money for these because money is worth nothing at the end of the game. So obviously, in the third round, that would be worth four extra points instead of four money. 
Well, that is it for end of round scoring. And in this example, obviously there would be no cards here and no cards over there. So the last thing that players would do would be replenishing this card row from the next round deck of cards. And then play would continue on clockwise from the last player to take a turn. So that is how end of round scoring works, and once players have completed all three of those scorings, the game will be over, and the only thing that players get points for at the end of the game is a single point for every plot that they currently own out here that does not have a building on it, and then you check to see who has the most victory points, and that person will be the winner. Well, at this point, we have now come to the end of the tutorial, and if you'd like to watch the rest of the playthrough, you can click the link for it down below in the description or by pressing the I up there in the top corner, and I hope you've enjoyed learning how to play Foundations of Rome. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including all of these producer-level Patreon backers. If you too would like to directly support the channel and the creation of videos like this one, then please go to johngetsgames.com support to see a variety of ways with which you can do that. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button down below as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.